morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Rob. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the, uh, the rodeo last night. From the sounds of it, it was pretty incredible uh, as an experience. We want to kick off today with a, a live poll, if you can get your apps out. By the way, nobody is, is beating uh, our number one leaderboard guy. I don't know if he's doing anything but tweeting and <laughs> posting pictures. Uh, but it's a pretty tight race for five and six, so uh, pay attention. Uh, here's your live poll. Do we have a live poll? How was the Interact Payments Panorama 2016 rodeo? Well, six of you say it was a blast. Uh, quitting my job. Let's at least get one quitting my job and joining the rodeo circuit. Come on. Just, no. There you go. <laughs> you are a great audience. Somebody said that yesterday, uh, and it's true. They, he was trying to butter you up. But this has been a, a really great conference for me because of how engaged you guys all are, and because of how great this app is. Uh, and the way that it works best, of course, is when you're using it, and you are. So that's been pretty fantastic. Uh, Brown Bagging for Calgary Kids, as you know, is the, uh, the charity that uh, Payments Panorama is supporting. And uh, if we wanted to let you know, we'll have more on this a little bit later, but Interact has generously decided to match the amount that Payments Pan Panorama is giving to this charity. It's incredible. And that means um, thousands and thousands of lunches. So uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, I want to tell you something else about Interact. Uh, as you know, they've been demonstrating here, and I think we've got an email address that we can pop up for you. There it is. You want to email them. I'm not going to tell you why, but you do. Uh, delegates who email them uh, will get a nice surprise. So there's the email address. Uh, make note of it. Write it down. We want to remind you to return here after your breakout sessions, after our uh, our rapid fire keynotes this morning. At 11 a.m., we've got um, Carol Wilkin Carolyn Wilkins here from the Bank of Canada. Uh, we've had a bit of a sneak peek about what she's going to be talking about. There's plenty of media interest. Um, they'll be in the room, uh, but it will be a fascinating conversation. And she's taking your questions. So if you want to know more about what the bank is doing uh, with Payments Canada, that's your chance. So we'll, get, we'll be back here for that. Um, and now we've got a company that's launching right here today. I'm going to be interviewing the CEO in a moment. He's somebody whom uh, you're familiar with. Meher Arar is his name. Uh, you know him for a variety of reasons. What you might not know is that he is uh, an entrepreneur, has been since he was a young boy. Popcorn Stand, I think, was his very first uh, business in Damascus. Uh, he is the CEO of Cause Square, and that's a Canadian startup that is providing a platform for nonprofits and community organizations to reach millennials. Uh, he's going to tell us more about it in just a minute, but first I'm going to roll a short video. Please join me in welcoming Mayher to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Mayher a couple of questions before I let him have his, uh, his rapid fire keynote. Um, and I want to start with why Cause Square? Why was this business something that you wanted to do? OK, let me ask you to throw another question oh, no, I before I answer the question. Oh. <laughs> OK. okay. Uh, Amanda, do you use Amazon? I do. To buy books, right? Yes. Do you read the reviews before? To I buy book? lots of things, actually. Do you, buy, do you read reviews or the star rating? Yes. OK. Uh, do you use the one click? Uh, Always. So your experience is positive, right? Yes. Why don't we have the same thing when it comes to supporting know. charities and causes? I wish we had the same thing on everything. <laughs> exactly. So that, that's the, pretty much the idea. There are other reasons. I have personal stories. Uh, the, my, one of my co-founders also has his, his own stories. One of these um, uh, negative inter uh, 
uh, part of this is that one day I wanted to donate to a local, local charity in Ottawa, and I went to their website. I had to fill out a lengthy, ugly, sorry, form yep. to be able to do that. So I said to myself, it took me like 15 minutes to do it. So there, there must be an easier way to do it. So that, that was really one of the, the other uh, story we have is from other co-founder. His wife work, uh, works for a small nonprofit in Ottawa. They noticed that 40% of the people who come to visit their donation page uh, on the web uh, are actually from mobile, okay? But they noticed the conversion rate is so little, so tiny. So they kind of said, well, maybe because there's not enough real estate on the smartphone to put that, to, to fill out the uh, credit card information. So that was an indication there might, there's something to do in this hmm. field. Are there other things like this out there? Are there similar well, kind of? There are many CRM, existing CRM. Some of them are as, as old as 30 years old. Some of them are new, like classy.org, like nationbuilder.com, about five years old. They're cloud-based. They're much better than the older solutions. There are a few apps out there, but none of them allows the nonprofits, when I'm talking about the donation apps, to control what, how they appear in the app and to interact. So that's why we shy away from calling this an app, because people will take us lightly. Uh, we call it a platform, which means the nonprofits themselves could actually interact and, and control how they appear on the, um, and we make interaction very seamless through via, via push notifications. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, push notifications have an extremely high open rate when compared to email. The typical uh, open email in, the, in this industry is 20 to 25%. For push notifications, it's anywhere between 80 to 90%. No wonder why Facebook and Twitter are very big on push notifications. I am a heavy Twitter user. I, I cannot remember a single time where I declined from pushing on my push notification. It's very addictive. And how, is there a limit on the number of charities that you could support? No, we're, we're actually not right now have about uh, 45 of them on the platform. Um, about 10 to 15 of them helped us uh, during the beta period. We are, in the, sh in the short term, to make, sim to make it simple for everyone, in the short term we're envisioning to be the Amazon for causes. But as time goes by, as we evolve, we're gonna be a combination of Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, and Eventbrite. So we would want those causes and those organizations to go on our platform and use an integrated solution. Also, we are going to be evolving into uh, personal P2P over time. It's a huge market. Um, uh, just to give you two, two examples here, GoFundMe.com is the leading uh, uh, provider in this market. They're cloud-based, and they raise $2 billion every year. They just were recently bought by a VC firm for $700 million. The other good example I want to give you tells you about the potential in this market, hint, 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 hint investors. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we're not looking for investment right now, but. Um, so uh, push, push, uh, push, uh, push Pay, which is a New Zealand company, they started in 2011, and five years later, they're generating $100 million in revenue. It's, uh, th it is very huge. And they only recently came to Canada uh, last year. And they only captured so far 1% of the market. So it tells you how huge this market is. And their niche market was churches. And they clearly, you know, they, 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 they clearly said on their website they only have 1% of the market. So here you go. The market is so huge. You've been, as, as I said, you've been on, an entrepreneur. You're an engineer. You've been thinking about designing companies. Uh, and in fact, before your life was interrupted, you, were, you had a business plan that Correct. you were taking to market. Uh, a business plan and prototype too. Right. Uh, what's different about this one for you? What's well, my experience changed my view of things. Uh, I now want to do something that have a social impact. It is a for-profit organization, so don't take me wrong. In fact, four years ago, I launched a non-profit uh, website, that, you know, a magazine that uh, talks about national security issues, but I shut it down because the, after three years, um, I could not get enough traction. So I'm, I'm not new to entrepreneurship. But basically, I, I want to do something that has an impact on the world, positive impact on the world.
All right, well, it looks like you're off to a good start with that. I'm going to turn it over to you for a rapid fire keynote. Great, thank and you. Rar. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you are enjoying this incredible conference. A little warning about myself before I start. I sometimes squint if the lights facing me is too intense, which seems to be the case today. So if you see me squinting, don't, don't take this as I'm angry. And if, if uh, you do not believe me, here's the proof. <laughs> OK, good. Good start. You have consumed enough caffeine. That's good. Um, I'll, I'll try actually to compensate for that during the talk by smiling enough. Today, I want to share with you a few reflections that are a product of my research into millennials and charitable giving. Um, and some other reflections, which have, which kind of, they're unrelated, they are a result of observations and interaction with the startup community. Before I share with you interesting stats and facts about millennials, let me say it loud and clear, I am not a millennial. <laughs> and my gray hair and beard attest to that reality. Um, I have spent the past six months reading research reports and articles about millennials, their unique habits, you know, what motivates them, what demotivates this generation, and how this misunderstood generation is different than the older ones. I say misunderstood because there are a lot of myths that have developed around this so-called me generation. The most common myth is that this generation does not give enough to charity. Yet the, the reality is actually totally different. Did you know that it is Gen Y, another name for millennials, that helped Obama secure his 2008 presidency? We all know that Obama was the first black president ever elected to, had to such high office position in the United States. So what does research tell us about this generation? Despite being 40% of the total population, according to a Goldman uh, Sachs study, this technology savvy generation contributes only 11% to the total charitable giving. I have just proved this must be true, haven't I? Well, it is, true until, it is true until you learn and realize that this percentage does not factor in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, which is the involvement of friends and family and peers in, the, in fundraising for a good cause. When this trendy approach is taken into account, this number goes up to a whopping 70%. The lesson here is that charity should, instead of giving up on this uh, generation, they should view the smart savvy or uh, technology savvy and smartphone savvy uh, generation as fundraisers and not only as donors. There is actually another reason why charities and nonprofits should, should pay attention to this generation, and they should do it now. This generation has a spending power of $300 billion and will soon inherit a whopping $41 trillion from older generations. Yes, you have heard it right. Millennials have a spending power of $300 billion and will soon inherit $41 trillion from older generations. And by the way, those numbers are from our US only, but I'm sure you're smart enough to be able to translate this to the Canadian context. And the reason is there's abundance of stats and facts in the states that I could not find for the Canadian market. Another important lesson here that I have learned about this generation when it comes specifically to philanthropy is that this generation supports causes and not organizations. So if this organizations want to capture this generation's energy and attention, they better start revising their entire messaging. For example, simple things like renaming the mission statement, the two-page mission statement, to a cause statement, which appeals more to this generation. Now, here's what's interesting. Once they believe in the cause firmly, this tech-savvy generation is not shy to involve friends and family in fundraising for a cause. Millennials typically use online 
and offline tactics to achieve their fundraising objective. The main lesson here is that NGOs should fully adopt web and mobile P2P and engagement platforms, a preferred technology by this energetic and vibrant generation. One important fact at play here is this. While they may not contribute funds directly, this generation or actions taken by millennials on their, on their, on their social networks lead other wealthier generations to contribute and to contribute generously. Unfortunately, organizations do not give enough credit to this generation. Partly to blame is this organization's inability to measure and track this indirect yet valuable contribution. Now, me, now like me and you, uh, millennials prefer visuals. I'm sure you all remember the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, the 2.0 version of the saying is that a video is worth a thousand pictures. I'll let you do the math. So what does that mean? It means that organizations that do not use video promotions or introductions to explain their mission or cause are missing the boat and they're missing it big time. There is really no more excuse for those organizations not to use this technology as it has matured enough and has become extremely affordable even for small organizations and tiny organizations, in fact. Your attention span and mine have shrunk over the past few decades, and it is more so for Gen Y. You will be shocked to know that the average attention span of a typical millennial is actually measured in seconds, not minutes. In fact, some studies suggest that it is only eight seconds in duration. Some other studies go further by stating that this also applies to this generation's uh, altruistic impulse to do good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is precisely how short this generation's peak desire to do good is. This becomes obvious when you know that <coughs> about 70% of individual giving is in the moment. This is precisely the time window that these organizations need to exploit. This, of course, or this in turn, dictates the use of mobile technology, at, mobile technology as no one knows when this impulse could strike. Here's the good news. Millennials own, 83% of millennials own a smartphone huge number, that they even keep, keep by their side when they go to bed. Did you know that mobile fundraising, either using an app or a mobile browser, raises 2.2 more money than web-only fundraising? Well, some of you might ask why. Well, to answer this question, let our picture those following scenarios. Joe is riding the bus, Nancy, is waiting in line to buy, to pay for her grocery, and Richard is vacationing on a nice sandy beach in the Bahamas. All three receive a request from the Red Cross asking them to support families that, who have been affected by the Fort McMurray disaster. In fact, all Emma has to do, Emma is the fundraising manager for the Red Cross, is to send a, a sweet, short, 30 second video clip via push notification asking donors to contribute to help those who are displaced and affected by this. All this video has to show, it has to tell a story in under 30 seconds. You could just show uh, houses being burned down and families fleeing. Now, how do you think the three of them will react once they watch this video. Well, in my opinion, if they had a way to donate on the go, they will most likely donate in the moment, provided they have an easy way to do it within this eight second window. 
Now, do you think Joe, Nancy, and Richard will donate hours later when they have access to a desktop computer? I'm not going to answer this question. Now, I would like to now share with you some random thoughts and feelings about the startup atmosphere that has been with us for the last decade, at least the last decade. Like you, I appreciate the fact that there are more startups, especially tech startups, being launched and that our Canadian culture of risk aversion is slowly changing, of course, for the better. But I find there is an unhealthy obsession about chasing capital instead of chasing customers. I also find that entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, are being treated like legends. This is really unhealthy because it makes things sound like if it is impossible to achieve what they have achieved. Now, let me now take a shot at the media here, tech media especially. Startups that receive funding get coverage. Profitability is no longer the metric and is not sexy enough to write about. Raising money, raising capital becomes the news and not whether a startup is profitable or not. Well, who cares about profitability anymore? No one talks about it anymore, right? So they talk about traction, but never about profitability. Media love to write about young fellows who launched a startup in their dorms before even graduating from university. It is a sexy story, of course, isn't it? No experience needed. You just have to be nerdy, sport hipster glasses, and wear flip-flops at the investor's meeting. <laughs> nice story. Unfortunately, this is perpetuating an atmosphere in which becoming rich quickly is perceived as something easy that could happen overnight. Let's face, let's, let's be honest. 90% of the stories we read about in the tech world is about overnight successes. There's nothing called overnight success. It is also, that's, that's the dangerous part, it's all sending a false and dangerous message that the old rules of sound economics no longer apply. Now let me share, I know many in the room here are founders and fellow entrepreneurs, so let me tell you what I have learned during the past six months. It's almost a secret. Nothing, absolutely nothing, replaces face-to-face all good-fashioned meetings with customers. Absolutely nothing. Another advice I would like to share is that you as an entrepreneur do 90% of the heavy lifting, and investors do only 10%. Investors might not like that, but this is the reality. And I say do not let anyone convince you otherwise. Another advice I would like to share, it is about time to think of employees as partners. I do not use myself this word anymore. I, in fact, find it demeaning. Now, another advice that no, never underestimate what you can achieve, define what success means to you, put on the turbo mode, and go and chase it. There has been no better time in recent human history to launch a tech startup. With the right attitude, perseverance, and help from your team, you can make the impossible possible. Now go and conquer the world and make it, make it a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mayor. Uh, what a great message. And uh, despite the slam on the media, uh, we know our weaknesses. Uh, it, really, it really is an important kind of reminder that sometimes the values that uh, were good and true 20, 30 years ago are good and true today. So, uh, and what a great business. I will certainly be. You've got to say what? Download the app. Oh, download the app. <laughs> it's about profit. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to ask you the business model, but I will do that on Bloomberg Television sometime soon. Um,